values and tools. And I would like to present five points, five orientations where values and tools come together. First, it's five like the hand. First, cosmopolitanism. Second, prudence. Third, place. Fourth, trusteeship. And fifth, art of living. Cosmopolitanism, the capacity and capability to tread lightly on the earth is a cornerstone for having the world society living in a convivial fashion. How to share equitably the finite environmental space first has to be answered in terms of every citizen in the world has got the right and the entitlement to the basic natural living conditions. And that is the limiting condition for our own action. So for instance, the degree in the climate discussion, how much can we get warmer, has to be decided in terms of human rights. It can only go so warm if you want. We can allow the temperature to increase only as much as not human rights are massively affected. Because we have a style of wealth which is incapable of justice. Therefore, to reinvent that style of wealth is a precondition for equity. Inasmuch as uh, ecology, there is no ecology without more equity. Because you need to cooperate. You need to uh, the base of cooperation in order to share the finite environmental space. And otherwise, there is no way of doing that. The second point, prudence. For 150 years, also that has been alluded to, economic progress, technological development has been based on a hidden assumption. The hidden assumption was the one that nature out there is going to be forever generous, forever abundant. The consequence was that technological development has been programmed, coded in a certain direction. Because don't think that technological development is an autonomous process. It is shaped, it is constructed, it is directed. So for 150 years, we directed in a way as if nature out there was forever abundant. The focus was then to be able to produce ever more things with ever less people. Creating superfluous people was the program of 150 years of progress. Now today, that assumption is obviously obsolete. Therefore, prudence requires to redirect the direction of technological progress. To invent a type of technology which allows us to do things with ever less liters of water, barrels of oil, uh, uh, tons of vegetation or soil. That is the direction of a ecological technological progress. It of course requires a new generation of objects, of machines, of infrastructures. If I may put only two kind of uh, uh, points here, using Paul Hawkins' notion, we have got to learn now to do things right, that you might call the notion of efficiency, and we have got to learn to do the right things. Now to do things right, yes, it has been said, the famous light bulb, of course, has a symbolic function. It says that even something trivial as a light bulb can be engineered and designed in a way that it gives you the same performance 
at a much lower input of resources. I mean, the light bulb is only a symbol for power plants, for houses, for lecture halls, and so on. My third point, place. Yes, the hidden assumption, if one wants, of globalization has been that place doesn't matter as much as communities don't matter. You look, look onto the world, you see one economic arena, and you say that economic arena will be governed only by the law of demand and supply. Place and community, in a way, degenerate to obstacles only. Fossil resources, in particular oil and gas, are to be found only in very few places in the crust of the earth. But people using them are around everywhere. The result that we have gotten long production chains, long resource chains between the sites of production and the consumers. Consequence, of course, the high consumers have an interest now to control the long production chains. The sun and biomass basically is available everywhere. It says every producer of electricity has the right to sell his electricity to the central grid. And second, it says it has got, the central grid has got to pay a price which makes it worthwhile. That Law has been responsible for the explosion in wind power in Germany, now in biomass, and in future probably in solar technology. It has, and I think that is important speaking about place, it has as a vision behind the Gandhian one, in a sense, without knowing it, uh, not, the, not mass production, but production by the masses. Trusteeship. Again, sure enough, it has been the widespread insight here. Nature is not a participant in the marketplace. Sure, we pay for oil, we pay for timber, we pay for water, for fish, but we, in effect, pay only for the work which is needed to extract, to transport. We never pay for the loss to the web of life, which is incurred by using these resources. We have to re-establish the priority of politics over the market, because we have to guard and to exercise trusteeship over the commonwealth and not only over private wealth. Yes, probably. The big task ahead is how to re-embed capitalism. How to re-embed capitalism in the social matrix as well as in the natural matrix. And I agree that carbon trading is what is going on. It's the, the great commons robbery at the moment. The art of living. Powering down is for me the key word for that meeting. Maybe one can slightly rephrase it and say, it is time to say a second farewell to the slaveholder society. Because each of us, we use 300 energy slaves, 24 hours a day for 365 days a year. Scarcity of time has become the nemesis of affluence. That's, that's the reason why frugality is an important ingredient for the good life. It allows you to focus on what you think is your project, and the art of living is like the art of music or the art of, of painting. It doesn't mean to use as many colors as possible, or to use as many 
uh, uh, tones as possible. No, the important thing is to find a selected number and to use it in an accomplished way. The same thing for the art of living when it comes to material goods. And I would like to conclude with an homage, if you want, to um, Henry David Thoreau, who, as you remember, um, for two years, well, he tried to live out in a simple fashion out there at Concord, at the lake. Let's not forget what he scribbled in his diary. A man is rich in proportion to the number of things he can afford to let be. Thank you very much.